I'm going to speak on endoluminal therapies in bariatric surgery. And this is a really exciting and rapidly growing area of bariatrics. And I, in my own opinion, surgical endoscopy, interventional endoscopy, and laparoscopy are merging. And the interventionalist of the GI tract in the future will have skills of both laparoscopy and endoscopy. And some of the procedures that I'm going to talk about are that intersection. So that many of the principles that we speak of are going to be surgical principles and the, the procedures that we're doing are surgical. They just happen to be done with an endoscope. These are my disclosures, none of which are, are pertinent to my discussion here. So what I'd like to look at are what are the roles for endoscopy in metabolic and bariatric surgery, both as primary procedures and then revisional, and then what's the data to support this? Where have we been, where are we going, and, and kind of what's next, and what are the future therapies in this arena? So if we look at the scope of the issue, there's more than 100,000 bariatric operations being done in the U.S. in 2010, and more than 350,000 worldwide. And we know that bariatric surgery is durable, and it's successful for treatment of obesity and metabolic disease, but not all of the patients that are eligible for bariatric surgery are undergoing it, despite all of those outcomes. And there's a subset of patients that are looking for non-surgical options. So what are we doing for those patients? Well, for the most part, we aren't accessing those patients very well yet. And what are the opportunities? And I think that the endoscopic platform is probably a good arena to do that. But if we look at endoscopic therapies, we have to think about where they fit with our existing bariatric operations. So primary procedures, standalone procedures where there's never a role for bariatric surgery for patients, uh, and bridges to definitive therapy. So maybe very high risk patients uh, that need to be bridged by losing weight prior to successful surgical intervention. So if we look at those standalone patients, there are certain people that just will never be a candidate for bariatric surgery. They're either too high risk, they can't undergo general anesthesia, or they simply don't want surgery. There are many patients that are fearful of surgical intervention. Despite our excellent outcomes with many invasive of bariatric surgery, there are patients that just don't want surgical interventions. For bridging patients, I think many of us understand that very high-risk patients, if they lose weight prior to definitive surgical intervention, will do better. It decreases their perioperative risks. It, decreases the, it increases the likelihood of a successful surgical intervention, especially a, la a laparoscopic operation. But I think we have to spin this a little bit, too. As bariatric surgeons, we're, we're bridging to our own surgical intervention, which probably makes the most sense. But there are many patients that are excluded from other non-bariatric operations based on their weight alone, right? So transplant patients, uh, especially with the epidemic of NASH uh, worldwide in the, in the United States. Uh, kidney transplantation requires a BMI cutoff. But how about other weight-related interventions unrelated to bariatrics? So joint replacement, hip, knee interventions. And then even ventral hernia repair. Data shows that in morbidly obese patients, ventral hernias are more likely to recur uh, for patients who haven't undergone bariatric surgery or metabolic interventions.